Dear Wally, well, I made it. Getting to Newark Airport was a bit of a nightmare, but the flight was great, and I'm here getting settled into my room in Indianapolis. I am so excited. This is my fourth general synod, but my first time serving as a voting delegate, so that's new, and I can't wait to see what new thing God has in store for this week. I'm told that's the theme, making all things new, so we'll see. Apparently, there are over 2,000 of us in attendance this year. 736 of us are voting delegates. Sounds like a whole lot of people for this introvert, but I know from past synods that there's an energy there that should carry me through. I know, too, from past synods that there's much hugging and greeting of old friends who haven't connected in years. 2021 synod was all online, so it'll be four years since I've seen some of these people in person. That part is going to be fantastic. It's like a foretaste of God's heavenly kingdom to see colleagues emerge from their small regions of the world and all of us gathering to really be the church together. No question, that's the part of synod that fills me the most. I do have to say, though, Wally, I'm looking at this delegate schedule. That's pretty intense. Three of our six days start with meetings at 6.30 or 6.45 a.m., and they run past 9 p.m. at night most nights. There are a few particular meetings, it seems, different ones, so the early morning ones are called caucuses. That's where we meet with the other delegates from our conference, Southern New England Conference, and we're taught about the various resolutions we'll be voting on, usually being spoken to by the original authors. So we know a little of what we're voting on. Then there are the educational intensive meetings. Each delegate is assigned a resolution, you see. So we go to small groups to dive deeper, going into the meaning behind that specific resolution. We do some wordsmithing, with the hopes that when the time comes to vote on it, it then passes. Wordsmithing in groups is so much fun, as you know, Wally. It's a great time. I can't wait for that. But then, once all that work is done, we have plenaries. That's the actual voting time, where all of us delegates sit behind the bar or in a certain section of a massive room. I brought a picture for us. Those of us who are delegates are sitting at the tables, and those who are our guests sit way, way, way behind in a massive room. But delegates sit behind the bar, which is a certain section of this room, and we vote. All of this is on top, this schedule is on top of what some people consider the more fun parts of Synod, like the worship services, the many, many workshop offerings, special meals with guest speakers, the exhibit hall hours where vendors and universities from all over the country and the world have information and goods to sell. I know that part is supposed to be more fun. I've experienced that, but I am curious about this voting stuff. How contentious is it going to get? How can we be the church in this very formal way where Robert's rules order? And Wally, here's my big worry. Is all of this actually effective Our church governance structure in the United Church of Christ is so, so different from most other denominations. The phrase goes that the national setting, in this case, the synod gathering, speaks to the church, not for the church. As in, each local church gets to decide what to do with what we vote upon in this meeting. They can make changes or they can basically completely ignore the votes. What will our beloved Woodmont UCC do with all of this, Wally? That remains to be seen. But I am really glad of something. I'm glad our voice is here. I'm glad we, tiny little Woodmont UCC in Milford, Connecticut, are here. I'm glad we're boldly proclaiming to the world our presence as a denomination gathered together from really small churches, most of us, to this national gathering. I'm glad we get to be one voice in the areas of justice and peace, proclaiming such things and answering God's call to do a new thing. Doing a new thing. That takes some energy, though. This is assuming I can get some sleep before all this starts, so I'm off to go do that, Wally. I'll write more later. Peace, Reverend Jill.
Just a trigger warning, before I begin my letter, part of this letter does involve a story about domestic violence, abuse, and murder. So if you need to excuse yourself for any reason, I should be done in about four minutes. Dear Maxine, this place is amazing. I've come to Indianapolis determined to cram in as much of the experience as possible. They tell me that's a rookie mistake but I disagree. You see, there are special lunches and dinners happening every single day, and they feature some incredible speakers. The first night of Synod, Reverend Jill and I attended an interview with Ibram X. Kendi, author and anti-racism activist. To call him inspiring would be an understatement. But the person who really blew me away in all of this was Brian Stevenson, founder of the Equal Justice Initiative, which has worked hard to exonerate innocent death row inmates and uh, confront abuse and aid children who are prosecuted as adults. You might have seen the movie or read the book about his life, Just Mercy. Every story he told us seemed more gut-wrenching than the last. But the one that struck me really involved a young boy you see, one night this boy's mom's boyfriend had knocked her unconscious to the point the boy thought she was dead. But he knew where the boyfriend kept his gun. And so that night he snuck in and grabbed the gun while the man was sleeping and pointed it at his head. Maybe he didn't intend to actually fire it, but when the man woke up and his eyes opened, it jarred the boy so much that the gun went off. Because of his age, he should have been tried as a minor. However, it turns out the man he just killed was a high-ranking officer of the law, and he'd be prosecuted as an adult. When Brian Stevenson came to the prison, this boy refused to say a word. And Brian stood across from him saying, you need to speak to me so I can defend you. Still nothing. Finally, Brian sat down next to the boy, and he noticed a shift. So Brian slowly leaned his shoulder against the boy, and the boy leaned his shoulder right back. Then Brian put his head on the boy, and the boy put his head back on Brian. And then tears began to pour from the boy's eyes, and he just hugged Brian. And he told them all the horrible things that happened to him while in that prison, unspeakable things that the adult prisoners had done to him while being held there. Justice, Brian told us, requires us to get close to those in need. He explained we need proximity to care for those who suffer. We can't care or fight for those we're disconnected from. And then he looked over the audience and said, you cannot be liberated if you're not close to the pain. Wow. Now, listen, Maxine, I don't mean to digress here, but I'm having a bit of a revelation at the moment, so I'm just going to keep writing. You see, I was recently accepted into Bridgeport Hospital's program for clinical pastoral education, which means I get to deepen my knowledge of pastoral care while visiting with patients there. Originally, I wanted to do this in a prison ministry, but some folks said, don't do that, it's not safe. And now that I'm headed to an inner city hospital with a trauma unit, others have said, are you sure you wanna see gunshot wounds and things like that? But now through all the noise, I'm hearing Brian Stevenson's voice tell me, justice requires us to get close to those in need. You cannot be liberated if you're not close to the pain. I think I'll focus on that. Talk to you soon. Rob. Dear Wally, I'm sorry I haven't gotten a chance to write to you in the past couple days. It's been a total whirlwind here. That whole sleep thing, yeah. Not very simple with this rigmarole of a schedule. But enough of that. 
I have to tell you about a truly incredible experience from earlier today. Our scripture passage is all about God doing a new thing, right? Well, back in 2019, I was at Synod and things were very, very heated. It wasn't around the sort of thing you'd expect though. We were electing our general minister and president and the board had unanimously agreed to put up our current GMP, the Reverend John Dorauer, for a second four-year term. Now I know John a little bit. I had spent a few days with him and a small group of others the previous summer. He's a good guy. I think he's done some good things for our church. But here's the hang up, Wally. John is a straight, cis, white male in his 60s. And our denomination has never had a woman serve as a general minister and president. Never. Which, considering the fact that we pride ourselves in being one of the most progressive denominations of our world, this strikes me as a bit problematic. Well, it struck the delegates in 2019 that way too. People were up in arms, not against John, but against the idea that any man needed to be elected again. There's a lot of history here. Two other women, the Reverend Delk and the Reverend Zickmund, had previously been up for election back in 18, 1989 and 1999, respectively, and neither of their elections had passed the floor. Well, John's election passed four years ago, but the conversation was contentious and the vote was much closer than these things usually are. I understood my colleagues' concerns as they got up to those microphones and spoke, and apparently so did Reverend John Dorauer, because he promised, when asked, point blank, that he would not seek a third term. He also pledged that he would wholeheartedly support a woman to be his successor. Which brings us to today, Wally. The board unanimously elect, er, put up the name of the Reverend Karen Georgia Thompson to the role. The Reverend Dr. Karen Georgia is not only a woman, but she is a black woman, and she is an immigrant. Her family hails from Jamaica. She's been working in the national setting for a long, long time, serving directly under Reverend Dorauer for several years, specifically in the area of disaster relief. So wherever there was a natural disaster, the Reverend Dr. Karen Georgia would be there representing the UCC. She is soft-spoken, and she brings a calm presence that reminds me of that of a chaplain, someone accustomed to crisis, someone accustomed to working through hard things and finding another way forward. Conversation around her candidacy on the floor was a little polarizing. She's spoken in the past about her beliefs regarding universalism, and some people were really challenged by that. But the conversation as a whole was largely very, very, very positive. She was elected with a very few nay votes and received an extremely long standing ovation. The crowd then erupted into song. And here's a video I took of that, which somehow I'm sending to you in letter. And in that moment, Wally, something happened in me. I found that there were tears streaming down my eyes. And I'm not a frequent crier, at least not in public. I turned to a few of the women standing close to me and they were crying too. The three of us looked confused and said, I don't know why I'm crying. I didn't expect that. I have heard for a long time and I have long believed that representation matters. My black and brown siblings in Christ in particular have taught me a lot about this. They name it often. It matters to see faces that look like our own on TV commercials and advertisements in Bibles. And I've always been on board with that idea as a concept, but as a straight cis white woman, I have had the privilege of never having to really experience the ache of not seeing someone who looks like me up there. But when the Reverend Dr. Karen Georgia Thompson took that stage, 
It was all I could do to keep myself from coming completely unglued. Women haven't been in the pulpit that long, Wally. I had a professor of mine at Princeton say that she was one of six students in the Div School when she was coming through. I'm really only the third generation of women who had that door fully opened to them. I stand on the shoulders of people like the Reverend Dr. Karen Georgia, who has been breaking stained glass ceilings for her entire career. And while I have no such ambitions, I saw her up there and I thought, oh my gosh, that could be me one day. Oh, and remember Reverend Delk and Reverend Zickmund? They were there too. The three women took a picture together on stage to thunderous applause. And in her acceptance speech, Reverend Dr. Thompson thanked them both and credited them for, quote unquote, kicking the door down for her. She may be soft-spoken, but that woman can speak. How's that, Wally, for God doing a new thing in our midst? The Isaiah passage we heard in worship the other night was articulated to the Israelites as a word of hope in a dry and uncertain time. And it says this, do not remember the former things of old, or the former things, or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? Well, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God for doing a new thing, for listening to women's cries for decades, for representation in key positions of leadership, and for the church finally responding. It's been a hell of a synod so far. I can't wait to see what's next. I'll keep you posted. Peace, Reverend Jill. Dear Maxine, I admit it. By the time day four rolled around, I was starting to agree with all these people who warned me not to sign up for so many extra events. <laughs> for lunch, I was registered to hear a panel of speakers talk about disability, mental health, sexuality, and wellness justice. But all I could think about were the other opportunities I was passing up. First, I had to decline meeting up with a group of alumni from my seminary. And then as I stood in line for this discussion, Reverend Jill and some of her clergy friends invited me along for tacos. Again, as much as I would have loved to join them, and as much as I love tacos, <laughs> I declined because I'd already paid for this event. As the panel was beginning, I quickly grabbed the food from the buffet and sat down. But maybe, I thought, if I eat quick enough, I can just sneak out and meet up with the alumni from my school. And then the unexpected happened. I'll just say, when two drag queens enter a room to start singing Disney tunes, you stop. <laughs> As one of them sang the song Reflection from Mulan, the lyrics took on a whole new meaning. Look at me. You may think you see who I really am, but you'll never know me. Every day, it's as if I play a part. And now I see, if I wear a mask, I can fool the world, but I cannot fool my heart. Who is that girl I see, staring straight back at me? When will my reflection show who I am inside? As the panel discussion continued, Reverend Rena Ramos got up to speak about justice for the LGBTQ plus community. She began telling us about a young trans man who'd been so moved by the openness of the UCC that he wanted to reaffirm his baptism as his true self, how he was today. Rena said, I was about to take him straight out and dunk him in the fountain. <laughs> Instead, they were able to reserve a space in the convention center after this panel. And as a number of us gathered inside this little room, I witnessed one of the most moving ceremonies I've ever seen. After reaffirming his baptism, the young man spoke and said, I don't regret my baptism as a child. It was very meaningful, but it was also under a name I no longer recognize 
and a person who wasn't really me. Because he found a place where people affirmed him as created in God's image, exactly as he was, this young man desired to reaffirm his identity as a Christian in the world. I tell you this story, Maxine, because the very next day, a resolution was brought to the floor of Synod for us to vote on. Resolution 13, actively affirming the human dignity of transgender and non-binary persons. The reasons for putting forth this resolution covered a range of issues like legislation in at least 30 states that threatens their health care and other rights, the higher rate of suicide and their vulnerability to violence and death at the hands of others, their lack of federal protection from discrimination, and a host of other reasons. They also spelled out that the efforts of allies can sometimes fail to provide the support that's intended, even in open and affirming churches like our own. Well, in response, we were agreeing to vote on the following actions, that we would reaffirm our commitment to recognize and affirm every human being as created in the image of God, that people of transgender, non-binary, and gender diverse experiences have unique gifts and graces from the divine for the life of the church and for society, that all settings of the church will work with local partners to advocate for their full legal equality, that will amplify the affirming voices in our sacred texts and stand against the harm done through the use of religious language, that will organize to provide aid, comfort, and sanctuary to all who've been made refugees by hostile legislation, and we'd call on the leadership and appropriate ministries of the UCC to create and share resources to help all of us develop gender-affirming practices. Well, in a church like ours, that vote sounds like a no-brainer. But the fact remains, shockingly, that only about one-third of churches in the UCC are open and affirming. And people living in different states and different contexts don't always share our views. I wondered what kind of a statement, good or bad, this would make on the man who just one day earlier reaffirmed his baptism in that little room, and to all our trans and non-binary siblings around the country. The floor was opened up for delegates to approach the mic and speak for or against the resolution. This had become a common practice to me four days into this thing. People provide opposing views back and forth, often sharing a personal story from their life of why they feel so strongly about their position. Eventually, someone calls for this part to end and we take a final vote. But here's the interesting thing. Not one person got up to speak against the resolution. Still, it was very possible a silent majority didn't want to speak out so publicly. And then the moderator said, voting is now open. I entered my vote and looked up at the giant screens with bated breath. The final result showed six abstaining, 10 against, and 633 in favor. The entire, I imagine people back home at Woodmont will be clapping about this when I get back <laughs> because that is exactly what was happening that day in the convention center. We were clapping and standing at ovation and oh, God is still speaking indeed. And God, it seems, has plenty more to say. Talk to you soon. Rob. <clears throat> Dear Wally, last time I chatted with you, I was talking about the Reverend, Karen, Reverend Dr. Karen Georgia Thompson's election. It went through so easily. It was such a beautiful moment. But the church doesn't always work that way, does it? Sometimes the emergence of new life means birthing pains. And sometimes God wishing us to do a new thing is really hard. Sometimes we don't always know what that new thing is, and we need to debate about it and get up to different microphones, yay and nay microphones spread across this massive room, 
and really hash out, is this the new thing God is calling us to do? Apparently, that was God's idea. So we've been in plenary sessions for the past two days. We are on day six, the very last full day of our time together. You may remember that the plenaries are the ones, the gatherings that we vote on these resolutions. Well, we took our time yesterday with a bylaws update that took a really long time to discuss and passed only by one vote. One vote. I'll fill you in on that one later, Wally. The process was completely ridiculous, and I honestly don't want to take up our time with what ultimately I think will matter much less than most people in that room think it will. But what that vote meant was that our time in these big plenary sessions was eaten away and taken away from some of the more intense resolutions we hadn't yet discussed. There was a question of whether we would even get through all of them. And as I talked to friends last night, we all unanimously said, God, I hope we don't get to the plant-based one. Alas, no such luck. So today we arrived at resolution eight, which essentially called for a plant-based way of life. The resolution was originally written by an individual in Michigan who is relatively new to the denomination. It was voted down twice there but she widened her network of support beyond her conference and was able to bring it to synod. Now, while most resolutions are written with the intention of actually passing, that's why they're there. So we're careful with language when we draft these things. They read almost like an academic paper, citing sources and trying to stick to the facts. The plant-based one, though, it was almost unanimously agreed in the people I talked to, read as angry. It was very hard to get through. And thanks be to God, I wasn't given this committee to sit on. They spent 10 hours wordsmithing the thing. And when you edit a resolution, you can only change a certain part of the document. So you can change what is called the whereas sections. You cannot change the part that leads into the actual resolution -y portion. So long story short, the resolution that came to the floor from committee eight had been very heavily revised. Nearly every line had been crossed out and rewritten. The general focus of it was to encourage options and accessibility for plant-based eaters. That sounds pretty good. But the part that could not be edited, the introductory portions and educational pieces, which was a couple pages above this one, still read as incredibly vitriolic. Coincidentally, I had had dinner the night before, I had dinner the night before with two dear friends of mine who are both plant-based, and I asked them, what do you think about this one? And my friends spoke against the resolution. They named that the conversation really mattered, that we should be having it. But in their view, it would have been much better to address the injustice around the industry that brings meat from farm to store, the fossil fuels expended to make that transference happen, and the work that can be done to support local options instead with an eye towards supporting plant-based options when we gather together. That, my friend said, would have been within the general UCC ethos. It would have helped more ch local churches think about how to implement this. But this resolution is not the way to go about having that conversation. So anyway, here we are, right, at plenary, and the debate ensued. People who are plant-based got up to both the yay and the nay microphones, speaking in their 60-second allotments, both in favor of and against. People with eating disorders shared their perspective. Farmers spoke up. People who had been assigned to the committee raised their voices to name how hard it had been to rewrite this thing, to get away from basically saying everyone should be plant eaters exclusively, to we need to embrace this as a viable option. These opinions were allowed to be aired for a while, but finally the moderator of General Synod called the question due to time constraints. Well, of course, people weren't happy about that either. He hadn't done so at any other point in our plenary discussions. But he, and I think everyone, knew that this resolution was frankly a total mess. And Wally, it was the only one not to pass. And by a very, very significant margin, almost two to one against it. Wally, this was exhausting. 
and polarizing. It was hard for some of our plant-based eaters who felt unheard. It was hard for those of us who are sympathetic, but who didn't think this was the right way to go about talking about this. Was God doing a new thing here? Will this galvanize us to reframe the conversation better in the future? I don't know. We can't always see new things. Sometimes we just see a lot of red letters that have been crossed out. But I will say this. It's all too common for things to pass in synod without a second thought. I was glad to see that the church, our national gathering, could be discerning together and ultimately even have the courage to vote no on something. We get the reputation here in the UCC, and I'm sure you've never heard this, Wally, of being open to everything. But with this resolution, we name that standards do in fact matter. God may be doing a new thing, but that does not mean that everything new is in fact of God. I was glad to see that we could hold differences and be thoughtful and model that for our local churches. We're nearing the end of Synod, so I'll look forward to talking to you about this when I get back. The, all the other resolutions passed, and I can't wait to share about what we might do to actually implement some of this at Woodmont UCC. More good conversation to come. Until then, blessings be upon you, beloved child of God. Peace, Reverend Jill. Dear Maxine, if it's possible to be both energized and exhausted, that might describe me right now. <laughs> With our closing worship behind us, our five days as delegates of General Synod have come to an end. While the days are often long, the testimonies I heard and the decisions we made have left me excited about where we're going as a denomination. And I couldn't be prouder to be a part of it. Still, I could really use a long nap, and so I'm just going to give you a few, a few brief points before I return home. First, it's amazing to see many of our people gathered in one place. Not only did I meet up with alumni from seminary, but also two of Woodmont UCC's former pastors. It's a reminder that even when we don't see one another, we're all working together in various places to serve as the hands and feet of Jesus in our unique ministries. Second, the Southern New England Conference gave each delegate a blank white thermos to decorate during our plenary sessions. We all began with the same two stickers, one for 2023, General Synod, and the other with our conference. But the act of choosing all the remaining stickers to adorn the thermos became a spiritual practice of expressing who I am and what I believe. Each person's design had connecting threads, but we were ultimately totally unique from one another. And that, to me, sums up the people who make up this united and uniting church. Third, on July 1st, many of us marched in a prayer walk to bear public witness to the to the recent rulings of the Supreme Court. Maybe one other. Ah, oh, there we go. <laughs> to, uh, to bear public witness to the Supreme Court, um, as well as legislation that went into effect that day in Indiana, which limited the rights of women's bodies and the trans community. And on July 4th, the resolution I was assigned to was brought to the floor of Synod and I went to the mic to speak in favor of it. And yes, speaking to over 700 people with a one minute countdown on the screen is as nerve wracking as it sounds. On both days, I was reminded that our faith often calls us to be a voice for the voiceless. Last, as the synod theme reminds us, God is certainly making all things new. Throughout the stories I've shared with you and all those I've yet to talk about, there's been this incredible feeling that something far bigger than any one of us is at work. 
I remember excitedly running over to Reverend Jill one day before a plenary session and filling her in on all these seemingly random but spirit-led connections that were happening all around me. And she just looked at me and she said, God's doing a thing. <laughs> and all I could do was look back and repeat, God is doing a thing. <laughs> See you when I get home, Rob. <laughs>